God is great. God is good. Who was thinking about the next part to that? And we thank Him for our food. Are you hungry this morning? Well, I'm sure you are now. <laughs> now that I've mentioned it. Be glad I put a, an empty plate up there and not one full of fried chicken and, and other things. You know, we're looking at this concept of... Uh, being hungry and thirsty for something more than filling our bellies. And so, no, you, you don't... Uh, I hope that wasn't a reminder for you to, to make that uh, reservation at, for lunch today. But, you know, uh, as Brother England mentioned, when it comes to when, we, when he was focusing on our giving, you know, we have a lot of things that are on our plate. And I, I don't know what is on your plate this morning. But I know that your plate, your specific plate, the specific things that, are, that make up your life and the things that are going on in your life right now, whether it is bad or whether it is good, your plate cannot offer satisfaction. It cannot offer fulfillment. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be Filled. They shall be satisfied. This is what we're going to be focusing on this morning. And we have a lot of things to look at. We're going to be looking at uh, six different things that, that Jesus spoke of when he said, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. He's trying to explain to us what righteousness is all about. And we're going to be looking at that this morning. But when we, when we understand that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, Jesus said that all these things will be added unto us later on in this Sermon on the Mount. He's explaining to us that it is not our righteousness, it's not what we put on our plate, it's what He gives us. It is what He commands for us. His righteousness is what we must seek first, and we were reminded of that also this morning. And so when we do this, how are we to focus? How are we to seek first the kingdom of God? How are we to do that? Well, we've been focusing for the last several weeks on what the early church did. The 3,000, when they obeyed the gospel, now what? What was the focus? In Acts 2 and verse 42, and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. That was what they were focused on that's what they, they, they put their focus on to press forward. That's what they filled their plate with. So this morning, as we, as we look to, to Jesus' righteousness, to His righteousness and not our own, we will see what true satisfaction is all about. And it starts with the claim. The claim has been the same throughout. For all of the, the nine Beatitudes, it will be the same. Blessed. Blessed. It is a recipient of divine favor was what that word meant to a, a Christian at that time. A, a Jew on the day of Pentecost. A Jew who sat down uh, to listen to the master speak uh, when he did this Sermon on the Mount. A divine recipient. And so the early church, did they experience this? Did they experience these blessings? We've looked at specific things uh, that showed the providence of the early church and how they recognized that the church was not theirs. It was Christ's. And that is what, bond, what bonded them together, what brought them together. And so this morning, we have that same focus. If, if we have that same understanding, we too will realize that we are blessed. You know, I want us to look at verse 46 there in Acts chapter 2. You'll turn with me to Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. It says, And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. You know, this was something that they were doing as they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. This is something they did every day. Day by day, attending 
the temple together. They weren't worshiping based on the old law. They were in the outer court. They were in Solomon's portico. They were listening to the apostles' teaching, and that's, that was something they did day by day. You know, what did Jesus tell his disciples, those who were following him? He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross once a quarter. Let him take up his cross once a week in the morning, but not in the evening. No, he said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow after me, Luke 9 and verse 23. And so we see that that's something that they did in the early church. They were devoted every day. Well, where does devoted found? Did I just pull that out of the hat? The ESV, I, I read from the English Standard Version. It's something when, when I was at Fried Hardeman, they used the English Standard Version. And so uh, my parents got me this for, for graduation, so I'm using it. But notice this word for attending in verse 46. You know, you've all fulfilled that this morning. You're attending. You're here. But the word for attending what meant specifically busy, busily. <laughs> that's hard to say. Specifically, busily. Busily engaged in. To busy oneself with. To be devoted to. And the ESV translates it attending. So, you know, you know, you can attend this morning, you can sit in this chair and not be busily engaged in the worship. Not be busily engaged in the plate in which God is giving you, in the blessings that He gives you. Maybe you're busily engaged with that plate that's full uh, of difficulties that are going on throughout your week. Not knowing what's going to happen at the end of the week. What are you going to do when it comes to striving to make sure that plate is is becomes empty or fulfilled. So what we see here is that they were devoted, and it is the same word in verse 46 as verse 42, and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. If you are devoted to Christ and to what He teaches, He will bring you satisfaction. And your plate cannot. And you will be blessed. And so it is very important for us to understand they knew these type of blessings. They knew that their blessings didn't come from their own hand. It didn't come from their own abilities. It came from God. And so for us this morning, we must have that understanding for us to go forward. And with that, that's the only way we can understand this characteristic. That we hunger and thirst for righteousness. If we don't understand the, the claim, if we can't have that claim that we are blessed, then we're not going to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Remember, we talked last week, it was not about our righteousness, our self-righteousness. But when we're focused on our own plate, it can become self-righteous. And actually, in, in verse 20 of Matthew 5, Jesus says, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness goes beyond that of the day, the teaching of the day, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. So he's about to explain that there is a righteousness, there is an understanding of the day that is accepted, that would not allow you to enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember the audience for Jesus here. These are Jews who, who would have depended on the scribes and the Pharisees to give them their understanding of the law. So what Jesus is about to tell them is going to blow their minds. Everything they thought was wrong. At that very moment, they think they're the greatest. They think they are the rich in spirit if they're a Pharisee, if they're a scribe. And that is the very foundation of... He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We have to see that what the Pharisees taught went against what Jesus is teaching. So we're going to focus. There are six of these, as I said before. This morning, we're going to look at three. Because there is a lot of information here. I'm going to try my best for us to get through these in a, in a way that will we'll handle the text. But let me tell you, there, we could spend a year on this topic. 
And we're going to focus on this for, it, for this morning. We could spend a year on each one of these, but we're going to look briefly at all three. This concept of hungering and thirsting for righteousness, there, look at verse 21. He talks about anger. And, and he focuses on righteous living. If you'll recall, this is the first step in, in a Christian life. Remember the first three Beatitudes have everything to do with how you stand as a Christian? Well, this is the first Beatitude that, that helps us begin our Christian walk. And so it is very important that we, we hunger and thirst for righteousness that is not our own. Because we're not the ones that keep ourselves walking. It's Jesus and His teaching. And if we hunger and thirst for it, it'll keep us standing. It'll keep us walking. But what happens with, when we've obeyed the gospel and then, wait a second, my brother or my sister causes me to stumble and, 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 and I, it causes anxiety, it causes grief. We could spend all day in Philippians chapter 4 with Yodia and Syntyche and they don't agree in the Lord and it's causing them to be worried. It's causing anxiety. If you look at that context. And we understand that when we have anger with our brother or our sister, it causes the, the opposite of the claim. How can I feel blessed to be a part of a, of a body where, where there's conflict, where there's, where there's pain? So he says, you've heard that it was said, verse 21, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. He is quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting the Ten Commandments. So is, is Jesus going against the Ten Commandments here? If we focus on 17 through 19, he is actually saying he's come to fulfill the old law, but he's still under the old law. He is not referring to the law of Moses. He's referring to how the Pharisees had taken the law of Moses and twisted it, perverted it. He says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. See, the Pharisees were more focused on everything, the final result of anger. They're more focused on, you just don't kill. Everything else goes. You cannot murder. That's the command. It's like the Ten Commandments were made into a bullet point. Just don't murder and you'll be fine. But anger was fine. Jesus is talking about the very first step that leads to murder. You know, if you're going to murder someone, this is something that, that we would think, wow, that's way out of, uh, uh, in left field. I, I wouldn't murder. But I'll sure be angry with my brother or my sister. You see, anger, if someone's going to murder someone, anger is most likely where it starts. Jesus is more concerned with the beginning and harboring that kind of ill will. And if hate is allowed to stand, where does that lead? Murder. They're more concerned with the end result. Jesus is he's concerned with the beginning because he says what? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others so that may, they may see your anger with them. So they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, sometimes we, we get focused on our own righteousness and thinking, look how good of a Christian I am. And people might see how great we are and say, wow, that, I want to be like so and so. You know, if they do that and we're striving to follow God and we get the glory for it, no wonder this world hates God. No wonder this world doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. We're taking the credit. We're putting a light under a basket. And if we do that kind of thing, then we can allow anger to stand. We can allow certain things to stand and... Not even think about our influence. That's what Jesus is focused on. He's talking about righteous living with our brother and sister. But what about righteous living with God? What does this anger do if it remains? Verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. 
Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So he's saying that this anger with your brother, it actually affects your worship to God. If you allow anger when you come to worship God, it is going to affect your connection to God. So you, you can't be claimed to be righteous. You can't claim to be the light of the world and, and, ha, and hold a grudge. Because it won't work as far as your relationship with God. Also, he's talking about righteous living when it comes to anger with the world. Verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Again, we are to be the light of the world. Well, what happens when our neighbor puts up a swing set that is, is, uh, is next to us and, and it, it's, it's above our security fence and they can see over and, and, and you just say, hey, why'd you put that there? And they say, it's my yard. And, and, you, and you just start a quarrel, a feud, till someone has to move. You know, that happens. But it's my right. This is my fence line. You shouldn't be able to look over in my yard. You see, that's sometimes that can happen, can it not? When it comes to our influence in this world, we must let our light shine to the world so that they see the difference. That they see righteous living. That's something we must focus on with the world. What about righteous living when it comes to lust? If you will, look at verse 27. Specifically, righteous living with our neighbor and our neighbor's wife. You've heard, verse 27, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Again, this is one of the Ten Commandments. Again, Jesus is focused more on the beginning, on something that leads to adultery, than on the end result of sin. That's why he mentions this in verse 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Do you see what he's saying here? Jesus is, is concerned with where our eyes are focused. He's concerned with this concept. And this day and age, we are inundated on cable, television. We're inundated on our, our, our internet and it comes into our phone that we can hold in our breast pocket. Satan has been able to use this tool as a weapon against righteous living. He is able to take, take people who are, are striving to follow God and who are going to struggle secretly with this very concept. Jesus is saying, you have heard that it was said... You shall not commit adultery. He's saying, I'm more concerned with the first step. I'm, not, I'm more concerned with the first glance, the second and third glance. So much so, he tells us how to have righteous living with the surrounding world. He's saying this, verse 29, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. You see what Jesus is saying here? He's, he's saying what's on the line. If you're filling your plate with with with, with lustful images, with things that, that would turn you away with anger. He's saying, get rid of it. Even if it means cutting your eyes out, if it means cutting off your hand, that's not figurative. Are we willing to cut off cable so that we don't fall down this path? Are we willing to cut off the internet? Are we willing to cut off the phone plan? Maybe we need to go from a smartphone to a flip phone. Are we willing to do this? Because look at what he's saying is on the line. Hell. That's what Jesus teaches. So many times we water down what Jesus teaches to say, well, WWJD, I, I had it on my wrist for years until the thing rotted off. 
that was a bracelet, WWJD bracelet. And sometimes we just say, well, what would Jesus do? It is a very good guideline, but he actually tells us what we must do. He's telling us how to re- live a righteous life surrounded by the world. Cut off what needs to be cut off in order for us to enter heaven, even if it means that we don't have the, the joy that is in this life that we think will be joyful. And finally, he says here, for our focus, righteous living when it comes to your spouse. Verse 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Jesus tells it plainly. And there is, this is one of the most heated discussions in, in, in the church, in this world, when it comes to the concept of divorce and remarriage. And I'm not going to stand here and say this is an easy concept. We have definitely made it difficult, have we not? And I can't handle every situation that we bring to this scripture. But my concern and my prayer for you is that you take the scripture, please hear me, That you take the scripture and apply it to your situation, not your situation, and apply it to the scripture. Because Jesus is telling you the truth. He is telling you what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And that is eternal life in in opposed to eternal damnation. Who Who would I be if I just skipped this section? I've preached this before and, and I've had someone come to me in my office and said, how, how could you preach that lesson? And we were going through the Sermon on the Mount. I said, well, he said, I need to be able to respect the preacher where I'm attending. I said, would you have been able to respect me if I skipped that section? Because I know I wouldn't have been able to respect myself. This is not easy. And I am not saying it with a smile on my face. But what Jesus is giving you is righteous living. He's giving you what, will, what will, will give you the light and help you to radiate it. And he's telling you how you can be satisfied. He's telling you that you can have satisfaction guaranteed. But I'd like to mention, before we get to that, po- that focus, he says... I'd like for us to see what the scribes and the Pharisees had taken with the command of, of, of thou shalt not commit adultery. They have not just the law, they had, they had written the Talmud, which is complete with their, their traditions, the Mishnah. And in this tradition, again, this is not the word of God. This is not the old law. This was their way of showing how they could follow the old law. It said this, if a woman was betrothed, on condition that she, was, that she has no bodily defects and she was found to have such defects, her betrothal is invalid. If he married her without making any conditions and she was found to have bodily defects, she may be divorced without a kethuva. All defects which disqualify priests disqualify women also. I looked at the old law and, and looked at what disqualified a priest from being able to serve God in the temple. So, this is what this is saying. If the woman, if the wife has a broken foot, if the wife has a broken hand, or one leg longer than the other, he could divorce her. In essence, what the Pharisees and scribes had done is they had put a man on the level of God with his priests. They had put themselves on the level of God to add that kind of of heinous requirement. Remember in in Matthew 19, they asked Jesus, what do you say about divorce? Moses allowed us to, 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 to permitted us to give a certificate of divorce. And what did Jesus say? Because of the hardness of your heart, he permitted it. So many times we look at our own lives and and we may look at our spouse and, and we may see, well, I'm not happy with this situation. And what does that lead to? Well, I want to be happy. 
God would want me to be happy. Have you heard that before? He wouldn't want you to do something that would be against what he taught. Isn't that the biggest lie? The scribes and the Pharisees had taken God's law for priests and applied it to a man with his wife. How heinous and how disgusting. But we do it every day when we say, well, I just want to be happy. If we think we can harbor anger in our hearts, if we allow our eyes to be filled with lustful images, if we are callous to the idea of divorce for any reason other than what Christ prescribed, we are living for self-righteousness and not God's. We are filling our plate with self-righteousness. And everything we do is going to fill our plate, but we will never be fulfilled. We will, ne- we will always go away hungry. What Jesus is explaining is that you can find satisfaction when you're willing to fill your plate with what He teaches. You'll be blessed if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. His righteousness. Do you hunger and thirst for his characteristic of upright behavior. It's not an upright behavior that's based on what you see in the the school line when you pick up your child. It's not based on what society tells you is right or what is wrong. It's based on what God is telling you this morning. He is telling you that you will be satisfied. You will be fulfilled if this is a part of your Christian walk. Isn't this amazing? This is the beginning of his, uh, of his Sermon on the Mount, and he's telling us how we need to live a Christian life. See, so many times we just assume what Jesus is teaching. We just assume that, well, I'll, I'll follow Jesus, or, or, you know, God is love, and he'd want me to be happy, and, and, and we go away from, and we just close the Sermon on the Mount. We close it. We don't read it. We don't study it. We don't apply it to our lives. We can get angry and we can leave. Because I don't like how things are going and so I'm going to go find another church. Let me tell you, you can find another uh, establishment. You can find another building that, that might have a steeple with a cross on it. And it might even be bigger than that one. But if they're not teaching what Christ who hung on that cross taught, then you will never be satisfied. And He is telling you what will get you into heaven and keep you out of hell. And that's why I'm here this morning to proclaim this message. And it is not an easy one. But it's something that he's offering to you so that you can be satisfied. I don't know, what, I don't know what's on your plate this morning. I don't know how how maybe there are struggles in your life that are, are, are causing you to be, to come up empty. But you know, you can go down the path of anger and you can hold on to it. How do you feel? I, I, have, a, I have a family member who, who's angry. He's angry with God. And he told me that. And what I see is, 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 is bitterness. I, I see something that he's held on to since 1992, and he can't let go of it. And you can see what, it does, what's, what it's done to his face. You can see the bitterness in his life. I've seen what lust allowed to stand has done to families. It's destroyed relationships, marriages, broken homes. And I know you've seen it as well. You've seen what divorce has done to, to our society, to the fabric, the nucleus, the family. And we look and we want to say, well, it's, it's the policies of the, uh, of, of the government. It's, it's, that's what's going to fix it. No, Jesus is offering what satisfaction can really be. If we're willing to follow him, people will start seeing the light again. It will radiate so bright that people will want to see, hey, I want to be a part of that. And we'll be a city that is set on a hill and it cannot be hidden. 
Maybe this morning, you've been trying to hide from God. Maybe you've been under that basket for too long. And, and you, you became a Christian, and, and you were shining bright, but this sin has crept in, and it is just blocking out that sun. What, did, what do you need to cut off? What do you need to cut away from your life so that you can be a bright and shining Christian again? This invitation is for you to make sure that your life is right with God. Sometimes that is just, it seems like it's wired shut. It seems like there's a, there's a lock and the, and the key is gone. And it's just staying there. Maybe you need somebody to help you. Maybe you need the prayers of this congregation. Maybe there's someone here that you, you respect, you trust. I know we all love and, and respect and appreciate one another. It's not in, in, it's not in against anyone. Maybe there's someone that you need to talk to. You need to share your struggles with. I want you to find that person. But maybe it's something that you've done openly that, that you know you, you, you've been a reproach on Christ and His church and you need the prayers of the assembly, of, of us together. This invitation is for you. Maybe this morning you've never obeyed the gospel and you've been trying to fill your plate with your own, your own devices, your own self-righteousness and you want what Christ is offering you. You've you got to repent of your sins, confessing that Jesus is the Lord, and be baptized in His name so that you can rise to walk in a new life. Satisfaction. Whatever your need is this morning, I pray that you'll make it known. You'll come. Let's stand and sing the invitation.